Welcome to Curbside Consult Statistical Review, where we break down study design and statistical methods in the studies published in NEJM. I'm Dr. Angela Castellanos. And I'm Dr. Amanda Fernandez. And we are editorial fellows at the New England Journal of Medicine. This week for our statistical review, we will be talking about the concepts of per protocol and intention to treat analyses, the pros, the cons, and why we do them in the first place. I started thinking about these concepts because of the variety of studies we talked about in our last podcast about management strategies for preventing asthma exacerbations. If you didn't have a chance to listen to the curbside consult with Dr. Drazen, that's no problem. We will be summarizing the relevant discussions while we review our statistical topic. Angela, can you remind us what the last curbside consult was all about? Of course. On our last podcast, we looked at the evidence behind the use of increased inhaled steroids in management of worsening asthma symptoms. A 2001 study by Volovitz and colleagues published in Clinical Pediatrics showed evidence suggesting that using higher doses of maintenance inhaled glucocorticoids for worsening asthma symptoms may prevent asthma exacerbations. However, this study did not have a control group and analyzed only patients who followed the study protocol. These results were in contrast to several follow-up studies, including the recent study by Jackson and colleagues published in NEJM in March of 2018. This trial randomized patients who were on maintenance inhaled steroids for their asthma to either increase their inhaled steroid dosing or to placebo when their asthma symptoms got worse. The results in an intention to treat analysis showed no difference in the use of oral steroids for asthma exacerbations between the two groups. So while there may be some benefit to increasing the dose of inhaled glucocorticoids, the Jackson study results should give clinicians pause when relying on this intervention to prevent asthma exacerbations. Hmm, okay. Let's take a step back. You mentioned that the Volovitz study analyzed only the kids who followed the protocol, but the Jackson study used what you call an intention to treat analysis. What do you mean by this, and why is this important to understand? Amanda, those are great questions and a great way to lead into today's topic. So let's start by identifying the problem. When researchers design studies, they do their best to minimize sources of bias. So after they've designed the randomized control trial, they have to think about what will actually happen when people enroll in the trial. So let's say we're participants in a study right now, Amanda. Okay, sure, we agreed to participate, but life happens. I mean, what if I suddenly won the lottery, moved to Italy, and I had to drop out of the study? Or if I had asthma, I might forget to increase my inhaler dose every time I had an asthma flare. Or I might start my asthma exacerbation treatment a little earlier than recommended because I'm nervous. I see where you're going with this. Or even patients in the study at last might decide to take their medications instead of forgetting to like they might in the real world. So we're only human. The way that participants behave in studies may introduce unanticipated bias. So when researchers design their studies, they also decide how they're going to deal with two problems, attrition and non-adherence. Attrition is when participants are lost to follow up and non-adherence is when participants do something other than the assigned study protocol. Okay, so before we go to the analysis, let's talk a little bit more about attrition and non-adherence and their effects on the study. Let's start with attrition. With attrition, you are losing people to follow up. Less people in your study means a smaller sample size, which results in less power for the study. This can introduce bias. Attrition can be random, having a life event come up and having to leave the study can happen to anyone. But it can also be non-random, like when a medication really has terrible side effects and more people in the active group drop out because they are over it. Exactly. And non-adherence can be random and non-random too. If a reason for non-adherence is because a protocol is too much of a burden for participants, you will end up with a non-random group of people sticking around in the study. And while some people may drop out altogether because of bad side effects like you mentioned, some may decide to switch treatment arms. These people stay in the study, but not in the way you design or assign them to be. And that may also introduce bias. Hmm. Okay. So two ways to reduce bias because of attrition and non-adherence, is to analyze studies either by intention to treat or per protocol. And each have their benefits and drawbacks. So let's talk about the intention to treat analysis first. It sounds pretty straightforward. We are going to analyze everyone according to their assigned treatment. Basically, yeah. Intention to treat analysis means we're going to analyze everyone as we intended to treat them, regardless of what treatment they ended up receiving. So for intention to treat analysis, we begin with the assumption that both arms of the study are the same. This means that if I have randomly assigned people into either arm, I am assuming under the hypothesis of no treatment effect that there is no difference in the way the participants will experience the trial or the outcome of each arm. 
So I have people that start in one treatment group and they cross over to the other treatment group. I'm going to analyze them and their assigned or intended treatment group. Because like I said, the assumption is that both arms are the same and it shouldn't make a difference if they switch sides and that shouldn't make a difference in the outcome. Okay, Angela, so what if we do get a statistically significant difference between the outcomes? Good question, but before I answer that, let's talk about what significance of no difference between the groups means in an intention to treat analysis. If there was no significant difference between the two outcomes, we have to think about why. Was it because the medication was actually biologically no different than placebo? Or was it because participants in the active treatment group didn't receive the treatment or couldn't follow the protocol to get the treatment as recommended? It may also be that the case that more patients crossed over from one study arm to the placebo arm for non-random reasons. Some statisticians and researchers argue that results from an intention to treat analysis are more generalizable to clinical practice because the results also take into account patient behavior. Think about it. Even if a drug is actually biologically beneficial, if a patient can't tolerate it or remember to take it, is it really effective? Hmm. Okay, so an intention to treat analysis, no difference between groups, isn't always so straightforward. We have to think about how study design or patient behavior may influence the result. So let's get back to the other question. But what if we do observe a statistically significant result in an intention to treat analysis? So back to your original question. A statistically significant result in an intention to treat analysis shows that despite attrition and non-adherence, the medication demonstrated an effect. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the results from an intention to treat analysis help us deal with attrition non-adherence by accepting these as a part of the treatment effect and give us some information about the overall clinical efficacy of the treatment. This sounds like an ideal way to analyze studies. Why don't we use it all the time? Good question. So the downside of intention to treat analysis is when we are interested in the actual biological effect of a treatment. Then you want to analyze the participants who actually took the medication. An intention to treat analysis may dilute the important safety or dosage signals. Also, we can't accurately say a medication doubles or triples your chances of the outcome with intention to treat because we included patients who crossed over or who dropped out of the treatment group in our analysis. So to measure the actual treatment effect or to assess biological effects of a treatment, it sounds like you have to look at which patients ended up actually receiving the treatment. Yeah, you're right. Another way to analyze data is according to the treatment received or quote unquote per protocol. Now, the term per protocol may not be the same in every study. There can be as many protocols as there are studies, after all. So before the study is conducted, researchers should decide the criteria for including participants in the per protocol analysis. For example, they should decide what determines if a person received the treatment or how long a person needed to be on protocol to make it into the per protocol analysis. In the case of the 2001 Volovitz study, Only children who complied with the treatment regimen and came for follow-up visits regularly were included in the final analysis. Okay, I can see why analyzing per protocol would allow us to look at the biological effects of a treatment. It allows researchers to specifically look at the participants actually took the medication to determine a dose or side effect profile. But what about attrition and non-adherence bias? What if people dropped out of the study or can comply with the treatment for non-random reasons? To answer this question, we have to think about how we try to minimize bias in the first place. So the goal of randomizing participants to treatment arms is to reduce unanticipated bias or confounders. So when we are reading a study, even before we look at the study's results, we should be in the habit of looking at the characteristics of the different treatment groups and making sure the two groups are well matched. Hmm, I see. So seeing that they are well matched after the initial randomization shows us how we've minimized differences between the two groups and hopefully minimize bias in the results. Exactly. So just like you would in an intention to treat, in a per protocol analysis, the two groups that are now being compared per protocol should also be compared for how well they were matched. Any variable that is overrepresented in one group or the other may signify non-random attrition, non-adherence, or bias in the results. So per protocol analyses are helpful when researchers are interested in determining biological efficacy, dosing, and adverse events. The downside is that the results only apply to people who obviously got the treatment and may not reflect the population efficacy of the treatment when it's widely used. Exactly. One last point I'd like to make is that neither method is perfect. In both settings, we're using tools to address study flaws. You have to be really careful with trials when there is a lot of attrition and non-adherence because of the bias that they may introduce. I think I've got it. We've gone through a lot. So let's make a summary to make sure we all understand it. Go for it. 
So there are two major problems in a study that introduce unanticipated bias. The first is study attrition, which occurs when people drop out of a study over time. And this can happen randomly or non-randomly. The second problem is non-adherence, when people don't follow the treatment protocol. This can also be random or non-random. The two ways to deal with these two study flaws are to analyze a study using intention to treat or per protocol. Intention to treat analysis is when we analyze the patient's data according to assigned treatment. The benefit of this approach is that it reduces bias that may come from treatment adherence or administration. It also determines a the therapy's effectiveness by the degree to which patients can continue and tolerate treatment. And the downside is that it does not allow us to determine actual treatment effect, the biological effect, dose selection, or adverse events of a treatment. But per protocol does. A per protocol analysis is based on the treatment the patient actually received. This approach is useful when we are interested in looking at treatment effect, efficacy, dose selection, and safety. The downside here is that it can introduce the bias of patient attrition or non-adherence into the treatment arm, and estimates of the effect may not be right. So the best we can do is know the strengths and weaknesses of the methods we are using to come up with these results and conclusions, and then think about how to best apply the medical literature in the clinic. Amanda, that was a lot of learning. Thanks for going through that with me. The many asthma trials, like the Volvovitz 2001 study and the Jackson 2018 study, use these different approaches, and now I feel like I can go through the differences more critically. Thank you for listening to this episode, and a big thank you to Amanda, our NEJM fellow here, for joining me in this discussion today, and also Dr. David Harrington, our statistical editor at NEJM who reviewed the contents of today's podcast. Our production team here at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Kyle Simmons, Mike Tomasis, Tim Bining, Scott Williams, Kathy Stern. A special thanks also to Dr. Angela Chen, our other co-editorial fellow at the NEJM this year, and our NEJM education editor, Dr. Opie Hammonvik. Because this is a new series and we're trying something new, we want your feedback. Please email us, leave a message, or review wherever you get your podcast. Feel free to reach out to us at the NEJM Resident 360 website. We're also accessible via various social media sites, including Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Dr. Angela Castellanos, Editorial Fellow at NEJM. Please join us again for our next episode.